And now we welcome to the science data and analytics track of PyCon Australia 2021, Marlene Mangami. Marlene is a Zimbabwean software engineer and exp engineer, explorer and speaker based on the city of Harare an advocate for using science and technology for social good. She's a director and the vice chair for the Python Software Foundation and is currently working as a software engineer with the Rapids team at NVIDIA. In 2017, she co-founded ZimboPi, a non-profit organization that gives Zimbabwean young women access to resources in the field of technology. She is currently pursuing a computer science degree with a concentration in machine learning and AI at the University of London. Her, ta her talk is recorded, so there won't be an introduction or Q&A, but you can find her at home on the web, marlenemangami.com. The talk is about Python and GPUs. Marlene will give us a brief history of Python and parallel computing, including Python's infamous Gil, and she'll also share how and why Pythonistas can get started with using GPUs to do more work and faster. Welcome to Python Australia, Man Marlene Mangami. And with all of you, a beginner's guide to, GPU for Py to GPUs for Pythonistas. I'm so excited to be here with you today for the virtual version of PyCon Line <laughs> uh, for PyCon Australia. Um, the title of my talk today is A Beginner's Guide to GPUs for Pythonistas. And I'm very excited about this talk. If you have any questions after I give my talk, feel free to um, find me on Twitter and just send me a DM. Um, I think I might be uh, around after this talk as well, just to answer any questions too. The first thing, something about me is that I am the current vice chair and a director at the Python Software Foundation, with the, which is the nonprofit organization behind Python programming language. It's a very cool organization that I'd encourage you to look into. Something else about myself is that I am a co-founder of a nonprofit organization here in Zimbabwe, which is actually where I'm calling you from, <laughs> um, called Zimbo Pi. And this organization just tries to get girls excited about programming in Python. And then uh, something else about myself is that, uh, a final thing about myself actually, <laughs> so that this isn't too long, is that I am currently interning as a software engineer with the Rapids team at NVIDIA, and I am working on a Python um, GPU-based data frame library that I will talk a little bit about um, some of the work that I'm doing in this talk as well. Um, the library I work on is open source, so you can also check out the code after if you'd like. So let's go ahead and dive right in. I think a good place to start is understanding why Pythonistas should be interested in GPUs in the first place. Uh, typically, when people think about GPUs, they immediately, their mind goes to uh, graphics cards or gaming. And I know for myself, I was really surprised when I started reading about this that um, GPUs were being used for anything else outside of the gaming world. And this assumption is actually not too far off base. In fact, if we did a quick search on Wikipedia, which as many of us know is the source of all truth, <laughs> we find that GPU is actually an acronym for graphics processing unit. And so the original purpose of the GPU was to create images for computer graphics and gaming consoles. So that assumption that I had, and I think many people around the world have, is, is actually fairly accurate. Since the early 2010s, we saw a sharp rise in the use of GP, GPUs, or general purpose graphic processing units. And as one can imagine, general purpose GPUs are GPUs that can be used for more general purposes. <laughs> and typically, uh, these sorts of GPUs are used instead of a CPU for executing tasks that can be run in parallel. So I think I have a pretty good example uh, to just demonstrate what this means. So one of the things that I absolutely love about conferences being remote these days is that I don't have to wait in line for a cup of coffee 
Like if I if I would like coffee right now, I just can get up and go to my kitchen and have some coffee. But sometimes you'll attend these conferences that are great and and not all the time as well, but you can find yourself in these really long lines waiting to use a coffee machine. And sometimes it's it's a single coffee machine. And now you're standing in line and you're debating whether you should go and give your talk like a mature adult or just stay and wait for a precious cup of coffee goodness. <laughs> but uh, there are a number of solutions to this problem. And uh, one solution that a conference organizers, if they can afford it, can consider is to add a, an extra coffee machine into the mix. And this is great because it allows things to move much faster because the queues like generally become shorter and, and maybe are even cut in half or even into a third. And people are able to access their coffee, grab it and go and get on with their day and be more productive. So we can think of the cores in our computers in the same way we would think about these coffee machines. In many cases, utilizing more cores can make us more productive in the work that we do. So a typical CPU contains anywhere from between four to eight cores, whereas a GPU can contain thousands of them. <laughs> so having a higher number of cores increases the computational power that we have and allows us to do more work faster. So just before I get a slew of <laughs> emails from people who love CPUs, this is not me throwing CPUs under the bus. I use CPUs. Actually, there are some tasks that are much better suited to using a CPU as compared to a GPU. So, for example, if you have a task that requires a lot of serial processing, where you need to process things one by one in a sequence, it would definitely be best to use a CPU in that case. Um, GPUs are great but they expect to run things simultaneously. And so if your computations cannot be done um, simultaneously, then it's best to stick to a CPU. And by the way, you actually can take advantage of more cores in your CPU uh, by using things like multi-threading or async IO, among other things, to boost your performance. Um, locally with the CPU. So from what we've talked about so far, we've established that if you're a Pythonista who needs to do some computations that can be run simultaneously, GPUs are a really great option for you to consider because uh, ultimately your work will be done much faster because your code will be running much faster. And since this is a beginner's guide, some people watching, someone watching might be uh, thinking to themselves, Marlene, I have been using Python for a long time and I don't understand why I would need to speed Python up. It seems pretty fast to me. And that's, you know, I think a good question uh, to, to, to pose to, to that question as well is, um, is Python slow? And uh, believe it or not, this is actually quite a contentious question. And when I looked online for answers to this question, I found some opinions that were helpful, but others that were, to be honest, probably borderline slander. <laughs> and I personally came to the conclusion that the slowness of Python is actually fairly relative. And many developers will likely never encounter this slowness that people talk about. Um, but to be fair, there is uh, some level of truth to that statement. And I do think that it's important that when we are talking about Python, um, potentially being so, that we give some context and explain what we're comparing Python to. So last year in 2020, Anthony Shaw gave a really great talk at PyCon US, and the talk was titled, Why is Python Slow? And in that talk, uh, he put this, this really great graph that's on the screen right now. Um, and this is a graph that shows the in-body algorithm. And it shows how long different languages take to run this algorithm. And uh, the program models the orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and is pretty uh, sort of intense. Uh, Python, for some of you, some of you may know that Python is a an interpreted language that is written and compiled in C. But if you look at 
the chart and you compare the time it takes for C to run this algorithm, C takes seven seconds while Python takes 14 minutes. <laughs> I don't even know how many times uh, slower that is. And you know, someone might be thinking, okay, but C is actually a strongly typed and compiled language, while we know that Python is dynamically typed and interpreted. So, you know, that's not really a fair comparison. But if we look at another language like Node.js, which is also dynam dynamically typed, uh, similarly to Python, we still see that Python is much slower than Node.js. So <laughs> if, you'd, if you're really interested in this specific uh, example and would want to find out some specific reasons about why this is the case, I definitely recommend you watching Anthony's talk. It's a fantastic talk. But uh, something to note is that even though this might be the case, according to Stack Overflow's developer survey, Python beats out almost every single other language in this chart in terms of popularity. And the truth is Python, to me at least, and I think to a lot of other people, is a really good and fun language to program in. Python is such a joy to use. And so if you really need that um, if you would want that speed up and, and making sure that you have uh, your code running as fast as possible, but also want to continue enjoying coding in Python, there are lots of ways to be able to do that. Um, earlier today, I talked about how utilizing more cores through things like multi-threading and concurrency can help us get better performance from our Python code. And in the past, Python hasn't actually had a very friendly reputation with things like multi-threading and parallelism because of, uh, of something called the gill. <laughs> so, you know, I wouldn't really have talked about Python and concurrency, Python and speed even, if I don't at least mention the gill. What exactly is going on with Python skill. And if you search online for PyCon talks on the Gill, you get this very strange mix of suggestions. Um, as you can see, you know, some people are talking about removing it completely. Um, others are talking about understanding it more, trying to help others understand it, I think. And even even more, you know, recently Eric Snow gave a talk asking whether to Gill or not to Gill. <laughs> so generally it seems like it has this really big repu reputation. So, so what is the GIL? Um, well, the GIL is Python's global interpreter lock. And this is a lock in C Python that preserves its internal shared global state. And what occasionally makes the GIL controversial is that because of it, no more than one thread can run at a time. And uh, for people that are wanting to utilize things like multi-threading, um, you know, which is running many different threads at the same time to speed up their work, the GIL can stand and in their way potentially. However, in recent years, the GIL has become less and less of a barrier for people who want to speed up their Python code in this respect. And GPUs are only one of a number of different ways to get around it. And I thought <laughs> this, uh, this next clip that I have on the screen is a clip from Raymond Hittinger's 2017 keynote at Pi Bay. And I thought it was really helpful in terms of helping understand why the GIL is important and some ways that you can actually get around it. Uh, my friend Larry Hastings is working on a project called the Gillectomy to remove the global interpreter lock from Python. Do you think that's a difficult project? That is an incorrect hypothesis. It uh, takes about a day of work to remove the gill. He removed the gill on the first day. It was no problem taking it out. The problem then becomes all of the locks that you have to put in everywhere else in order to get Python uh, uh, to function. It turns out that's not particularly hard either, and a few days later, he had that done. So the gill is gone and replaced by uh, lots of other little locks on smaller data structures. Problem solved. Any questions? Oh, are locks expensive to acquire and release? In fact, they are. 
And so the good news is the gill is gone, it's free threaded, and it's uh, dozens of times slower than regular uh, uh, Python. So you actually get a payoff for the gill. And the payoff is you don't pay all of the performance cost of all of these individual lock acquires and uh, our, our releases. It's actually a really nice thing uh, uh, to have. It gets in the way of us th free threading, but we have ways of solving that problem. If you can't fully free thread one Python, why don't I run eight Pythons in parallel, each with their own threads, and then it's no problem. I'm taking advantage of all of uh, the cores. Or you can combine threading and multiprocessing. Uh, there's a number of ways to uh, go. In fact, at some point, most folks just get over that Python has a global interpreter lock, go ahead and saturate all eight cores to 100% and get full advantage of the machine and just simply ignore the problem. There's lots of ways to ignore the global interpreter lock. It is not that big of a deal. Okay, so like Raymond said, when we utilize all of our cores, we don't really need to worry about the gill. And with GPUs, we have thousands of cores. So if we decide we wanted to even just run one thread on each core, we would still have a really significant speed up. Okay, so <laughs> great. Now that we've looked at some of the big performance issues that would lead us to possibly using a GPU when we're running Python, let's go ahead and look at some practical examples of how we can do this. So modern data sets can have as much as millions, even billions of data points that need processing. And for the average data scientist that is working with these large data sets, just using ordinary Python for processing this information is not very efficient. And most of the time, you know, they would spend, if they chose to, to run Python only, they could spend a lot of time just waiting around and not being productive. But these days, data scientists wanting to perform larger computations on data sets or wanting to filter through information in larger quantities, um, there are a number of different uh, libraries available. So Pandas is probably the most popular solution for this. Um, it's a data science library written in Python, C, and Cython that uses vectorized operations in order to run functions at very high speeds. And although it doesn't use GPUs, <laughs> let's quickly take a look at how much of a speed up we get when we try to create a data table with pandas versus with Python. So at the moment, we are starting off on Google Colab. And this specifically for context is the Rapids Notebook. Rapids has a really great um, free notebook on, um, if you just go to the Get Started page, um, you can have access to this notebook. And basically, it allows you to test out a GPU and the different um, Rapids libraries very quickly and um, we'll just walk you through some of the basics of that. Um, we are not yet starting off with our GPU, but just to give you some extra context, um, at the moment we are going to, we are importing our libraries and then we're creating um, some data using uh, NumPy, some random data, and then I'm going to start off by creating a pandas data frame and this is you know a very simple way to do it and then after we create this data frame we're going to see how long it takes using um, the time module we're going to see how long it takes for um, pandas to calculate the mean of the data in this column okay so i'm just going to go ahead and do that i'm going to create a a uh, separate column in the pandas data frame and I'm going to go ahead and um, use the pandas rolling method um, to calculate the mean and this is a great method that really speeds things up um, yeah <laughs> so let's go ahead and see how long it takes for um, pandas to calculate the mean that was really quick. <laughs> and it takes about 0 0.03 seconds, as you can see there, which is really fast. Um, now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out um, how long it's going to take for Python to do the same thing. And instead of using the Python rolling method, we're going to create, as I'm doing now, um, we are going to create a for loop. And 
basically what this for loop is going to do is it's uh, we're going to use the mean loop column in the data frame and uh, we are going to just loop through all of the values and calculate their means <laughs> and add them to the uh, to the data frame as well um, but this time of course using Python and not pandas. So as you can guess, this is probably going to be longer. We're going to, um, just going to fill this up, but we're going to, um, yeah, we're just going to, we're going to calculate this and also time it and see how long it's going to take uh, for all of these loops to run. Let's just comment out that code and let's run it to see how long that's going to take. So the loop here <laughs> using uh, Python looping over took a full one second um, and 16 seconds. Let's just do it both. That's a lot, that's a big difference. <laughs> um, that's a really significant difference. So as you can see, it's possible to get a speed up of about 2,500 times just by switching to this library. This probably explains why most data scientists choose to work with pandas as compared to writing their code in pure Python. Um, now, even though you'll get a significant speed up just by sp switching to this sort of workflow um, from Python to pandas, making use of a GPU, especially for larger data sets, can take things even further. And earlier, I have been interning as a software engineer with the Rapids team at NVIDIA, and I've really enjoyed working uh, with the team there. I've enjoyed working on this project. Um, KDF is an open source Python-based <laughs> GPU data frame library. And uh, for data scientists, Pythonistas that are wanting to work with data, um, it allows you to do a lot of those operations like loading or joining, aggregating and filtering and different things like that. Um, but it makes it possible for you to to do those computations on the GPU. And how the team has designed this uh, QDF is to really mirror the Pandas API. So a lot of the things that if you can do something <laughs> in Pandas, you should be able to do that same thing in QDF. So uh, I think as well, because the APIs are so similar in how they've been written, um, it's really intuitive to make a switch. So I'm going to go ahead and show you an example of what it looks like. Right. So here we would like to compare pandas and QDF and see the difference in speed. For this, we're going to be using Timeit um, to just see how um, how long it takes for pandas to do some calculations and how long it takes for QDF to do calculations. So as you can see, um, Right now at the top, we are creating a pandas data frame, and this data frame has significantly more data than last time. And then I want to show just how easy it is to convert a pandas data frame to QDF. And uh, it's, it's a very similar um, instruction, and then you're using the method from pandas and just putting in um, your original pandas data frame. You can also create your own um, you can also create your own QDF data frames from scratch if you uh, if you'd like to as well. And so we are going to start off by you know using pandas to calculate the mean of the data that is in our pandas data frame. And we're going to do the same thing as well with QDF, and we're going to time both of these um, operations and see how long it takes um, to do this with pandas and then to see how long it takes to do this with QDF. So go ahead and run this and see what the time takes. So it takes, um, that's great, it takes about 156 milliseconds per loop for pandas and 3.56 milliseconds per loop for um, QDF, which is really significant. So I did want to also show you a second calculation, um, which is just merging um, data together. And 
I ran out of RAM <laughs> to do this on Google Collab because it is a, a much larger computation to do. And so instead of trying to do it here, we're just going to move over to um, to Jupyter to a Jupyter notebook that um, is using my own local GPU. So here we are in our Jupyter notebook, and uh, behind the scenes we are running a GPU, um, so we are still able to access our QDF GPU data frame. Um, we have a similar setup from what we had last time. We're importing our libraries and creating the same data frame with pandas. But this time we're trying to merge the data together, at first with pandas, and then um, with QDF. So I'm just running that. And um, yeah, so I had to, this was this took quite a long time to run, uh, particularly with pandas. So I had to speed things up. <laughs> so I'm just gonna jump forward a little bit. All right, so it did take quite a long time to get through the calculation <laughs> with pandas. I actually cut out a whole section of time. Um, and here, the pandas to go through all of it took about um, one minute, 10 seconds, um, plus or minus 486 milliseconds per loop, um, which is quite a lot of time <laughs> to go through all of those loops. Um, it was it was a lot of data, so it, you know, pandas was quite slow. Um, but next, we can just let it go through and calculate. And as you can see, for um, QDF, it was much faster. It took about 367 milliseconds um, to calculate to, to calculate that per per loop, um, which is a lot faster. So definitely that's a fantastic way to get speed ups and from your Python code. But QDF is not the only way that Pythonistas are using or can use GPUs. There are lots of fields where um, people using Python can get speed ups in their Python code. One of those fields is mathematics. You know, we have in data visualization, machine learning and AI, gaming and graphics, just lots of ways that Pythonistas can utilize GPUs to get speed ups. And you might be watching this and thinking to yourself, you know, Marlene, I can't afford a GPU or I don't know where to get a GPU. <laughs> um, you can definitely Google it, but um, there are some great um, resources online and Right now, I, I would say GPUs are quite accessible online. Um, and, and in some cases, you can actually get them for free or use them at a really good sort of cost rate. And uh, here on the screen, I have some examples of places that you could access a GPU even right away. I know for the Rapids team, we actually have a, a a Google Colab notebook on the website. <laughs> I'll put a link to the website there um, that you can actually take a look at and you can go to the Colab notebook and actually try out the um, the different libraries for free. Um, so definitely would encourage you to do that if you would like to. Um, that is actually the end of my talk. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know after this talk or <laughs> feel free to also reach out to me on Twitter. I'm Marlene underscore ZW. Thank you so much for, for listening. Hello again. A uh, reminder that the previous talk was recorded, so there will be no questions. But thank you, Marlene Mangami, anyway. I mean, thank you for presenting at PyCon AU. Uh, there's a rest now. There's a bit of a break for 45 minutes. And uh, last block of the day will begin at 4.15 Australian Eastern Time. Uh, so take a break, maybe hydrate, maybe stretch your legs. See you then.